Good morning. Here. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. This is Bajet from Firma Cove with the Maine Summer Camp Education Committee. Uh, today I'm here with Jennifer Springer and Laurie Davis, and I'd like to welcome them. They'll be um, doing the presentation today, and they'll answer any of your questions at the end of the presentation. And I'd also like to thank uh, Andrew Scoggin Bank for sponsoring our webinars. Sorry for any other delay. There was a few technical difficulties, but we're glad to be starting now. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar regarding preparing your youth camp uh, for the summer food service season. We Thank you for coming, and we hope you learn a lot from this presentation. So first, we're going to discuss what I think is one of the best ways to uh, prepare your camp for the summer season, and that is to have a well-qualified person in charge. The person in charge is generally the kitchen manager, or the food service manager, and this person is going to be required to take a certified food protection manager certification course and exam. This person, um, to, be, to be a good person in charge, they will not just take the exam and pass it, but they will take the um, information that they learned from the exam and they will make policies and procedures to train their employees um, on food safety and they're going to strive for what we call active managerial control. If you want to learn more about active managerial control, we Ron sent out a handout along with a, a bunch of others on that. But basically what that means is that they have trained their employees um, in the policies and procedures and so that they know that through these tested procedures, they are doing what they need to do to keep the food safe. Uh, some other duties of the person in charge are to oversee the processes that are gonna make sure that the employees are cooking, serving, holding, cooling, and reheating foods to proper temperatures. They are gonna be responsible for excluding and restricting ill employees. And we're gonna talk about that later when we cover the employee health policy. The person in charge is also going to ensure um, good personal hygiene. So employees are coming in clean and with clean outer clothing, that they follow proper hand washing procedures, that food is coming from an approved source, that it's delivered at the proper temperature, and that once they um, get it, it's gonna be stored correctly under the proper temperatures and protected from contamination. And the person in charge is going to make sure that food, linens, equipment, and chemicals are also stored correctly, and that the physical facilities are maintained. So basically, the person in charge is really, they are overseeing the entire facility day by day um, as, as food comes in, as it's received, and they see the whole process from receiving through the time that the food is served um, to your campers. Another way that every year that we're going to make sure that um, we are serving safe food is by making sure that our, our water is from a potable water source. So if you... Um, are open enough days and serve enough campers, then you're gonna be what we call a public water system and drinking water program is going to regulate you. And they're gonna be uh, the ones that tell you how often to test your water to make sure that it is safe to drink. Um, if you're already on a town or a city water supply, then they are, uh, uh, they are a public water system and drinking water program um, oversees what they do. You could also be considered a non-public water system um, but you still have to make sure that your everything is maintained and constructed properly with your well system. And if you're a non-public water system, this means that you're either not serving, you're not serving enough campers for enough days a year to be required to um, be a public water system. You're going to have to keep your most recent sample on file, and we always look at that when we come and do a camp inspection. So having that uh, water sample report ready for us to look at will help you um, kind of ex ex expedite that process. And every year you're gonna have to send in a copy of um, your water test for total coliform bacteria and nitrates to our program, the health inspection program, in order to renew your license. Even if you have a non-public water system, you still have to meet the same water quality standards with zero colony form units of coliform and uh, a 10 part per million nitrate maximum. And if you're getting water from a surface water source like a lake, then you're gonna have to chlorinate that water and maintain a residual of 0.5 parts per million. Um, this isn't super common, but we do see it more often with youth camps and some other types of establishments just because of the way that you folks operate. 
Um, and you might, if you have a non-public groundwater or surface water source, then you might have to test your water more frequently in order to make sure that it's safe. So now we're going to move into ways to prevent contaminating food. So I'm just going to pose a question. What is the best way to prevent the contamination of food? Um, I think most of us are well aware of the best way, but we're going to talk about hand washing. And that is definitely the best, uh, the best way to prevent the spread of foodborne illness. And um, do you see on the slide the times when you need to wash your hands? Um, so before preparing food, after using the restroom, after handling raw foods, coughing or sneezing, caring for animals, eating or drinking, uh, so basically, anytime your hands become contaminated, uh, you're going to need to wash them. Now that we know when to wash our hands, we need to know where to wash our hands. We're going to wash our hands at a setup like you see in the uh, picture here. It uh, needs to be at a, a specific sink that's dedicated to hand washing only. So it's going to have a sign with a hand, that says hand wash only. It's going to have paper towels, soap, a trash can, and running water that is at least 100 degrees. And just a little reminder there that we're not going to wash our hands at the hand at the dishwashing sink, mop sink, or food prep sink. It's going to be only at that uh, hand washing sink. So how we wash our hands? We're going to wet our hands with warm running water. We're going to use soap. Rub our hands together for 20 seconds minimum, making sure that we pay attention to um, any soil under our fingernails. That we're cleaning the exposed portions of our arms in between our fingers, and we're going to rinse thoroughly. And if you're in a kitchen, you're generally going to be drying your hands with a disposable paper towel. If you're in the restroom, maybe an air dryer. But we do not want to dry our hands on clothing, um, our apron, or any cloth towels because they could harbor bacteria that we don't want to recontaminate our hands with. And then if we're using a faucet that's not an automatic faucet, we want to make sure that we're using a barrier like a paper towel to turn off the faucet. And that's going to help us keep from recontaminating our hands. And just, from, again, a reminder that we're not going to use um, a hand sanitizer or sanitizing hand dip in place of hand washing. Another great way to prevent um, spreading foodborne illness is creating an employee health policy. Uh, this camp season, as we did last camp season, we'll be bringing around what we are calling the red folder to um, each camp, each camp kitchen, and training people on um, the employee health policy that is laid out in the food code. And we just want to make sure that Everybody um, has an, an appropriate policy. Sometimes we see that there's a policy that is for the entire camp or the entire establishment. And um, there may be some of what we need to be contained in the policy, but not everything because this policy is geared more toward food service specifically. So we sent out handouts for this as well. And printing these handouts and training your employees before camp gets started will help you with your kitchen inspection uh, this year for sure as we are going to be asking questions about that. But the general information that we need to train employees on is on this slide. The uh, employees need to be trained on the big five, the E. coli, Salmonella typhi, Shigella, norovirus, and hepatitis A, and also on the symptoms that they can't come to work with or need to report to the person in charge before they come to work. The vomiting, diarrhea, jaundice, sore throat receiver, and skin infections, um, especially if they're open sores on the arms or hands. This is just uh, so that you can see what our um, handout looks like. This is the first form, and it's used to train employees with. I'm not going to um, go through all that again, but um, this is the one that you would use to train your employees with. And it gives a little um, information at the top there as to how people become sick from contaminated food. So um, basically, an employee is ill or getting over an illness, um, and they contaminate the food through poor hand washing, and it goes out to the customer and it can make them sick. So that's what we're trying to avoid with this policy. Uh, so things that you need to know for the employee health policy. Employees need to be required to tell the person in charge if they have those symptoms, if they're diagnosed with one of the big five, or if they have a confirmed exposure to one of the big five. And the person in charge needs to know when to exclude or restrict an ill employee, and when an, an employee can return to work after um, they've experienced symptoms. So. Exclusion means that the employee cannot come to work. If they are actively ill, whether diagnosed or not, they can't come to work. Um, and under, but under some circumstances, an employee could be restricted, meaning that they can't work around food or wash dishes or um, work in the general food production area, but there might be something that they could do. So you could allow them to come to work if you had something they could do that was not directly working with food, um, but they wouldn't necessarily have to be completely excluded. 
the person in charge also needs to know that if somebody reports the diagnosis of one of the big five, that they are supposed to contact the health inspection program so that we can assist you with what to do uh, when that happens. So our food code requires that you have a policy about employee health and that you train on it. We don't recommend that, I mean, we don't require that you document the training, but we do recommend it. We think it's very important. So um, in the handouts that you were provided, you may have seen this form, and this is the reporting agreement that your employee can read down through and sign. And they're just, by signing this, just saying that they uh, understand the policy and they agree, agree that they're going to report these um, issues to the person in charge. And we have uh, provided this handout for you as well. This is a person in charge only form. This is a decision tree to help the uh, person in charge decide what do I do if. Um, not going to go through this entirely, but look through it. And if you have questions about it, for sure, ask your health inspector or send us questions about it. It kind of explains the exclusion restriction and, and what to do when people are coming back from illness. Another way that uh, we want to make sure that we're preventing contamination is through the, is through the food employee. Um, probably most food becomes contaminated by employees not properly washing their hands, they're properly using gloves. So that's an important thing, making sure that we have a code-based or stricter health policy that folks are using effective hair or beard restraints. They have clean outer clothing and a plain ring only um, is allowed like a wedding band. Uh, they should not have any jewelry on their wrists. Um, they shouldn't have uh, any, even if it's a medical bracelet, we don't allow that. So nothing on their wrist, no watches, no, no bracelets, no jewelry on their wrist. Fingernails need to be maintained. If somebody does have polish or artificial nails, then they need to wear gloves when working with exposed food. It doesn't have to be ready to eat food in this case. So whenever they're working with exposed food, they need to wear gloves. We're going to limit eating and drinking to areas where food, equipment, and linens cannot be contaminated. We can use, um, to help avoid contamination, we could use a cup with a cover and a straw or a travel style cup with a cover and a handle, but we still want to place that in an area where food and food contact equipment cannot become contaminated. In the state of Maine, we do not allow for folks to touch ready-to-eat foods with their bare hands. That's what this bare hand contact with ready-to-eat food prohibition means. Uh, ready-to-eat foods are foods that do not require further cooking um, or washing to be considered safe to eat. So in order to keep from touching these foods with our bare hands, we can um, use gloves, utensils like spatulas or tongs, jelly paper, um, or dispensing equipment to avoid contacting ready-to-eat foods with our bare hands. And we also kind of want to reiterate that the use of gloves does not replace good hand washing practices. When we say you need to use gloves, we mean you need to have clean gloved hands. Wash your hands first. So we're going to talk a little bit more about proper glove use. Hand wash, hands must be washed before putting gloves on. You're going to use your gloves for one task only, and you're going to wash your hands whenever you change tasks or have glove changes. When gloves become soiled or damaged, you want to throw them away and fabric or other reusable gloves cannot be used with ready-to-eat foods. So we talked about using utensils to avoid bare hand contact. Um, we allow you to store and use utensils kind of in specific ways. They can be stored in a closed container with bulk food items. Like you see in the middle picture down there at the bottom, we generally see flour, sugar, um, and those types of foods in those bigger containers. You can't see if there's utensils in those or not, but we would allow you to have a utensil stored inside those containers. Um, and you see here to the left, there's some canisters and there are scoops in those with handles and the handles are not touching the food. That is an appropriate way to store a utensil um, inside of a container. Essentially, the, we want the utensil to be closed into the container with the food product, but the handle cannot be touching the, the product. You can store um, any utensils and potentially hazardous foods as well, like you see down at the um, buffet line over on the right. The handle has to be above the food in the container and above the top of the container. We want to make sure that handle that people are touching to serve does not come into contact with the food. You can also store any utensils on a clean portion of your food uh, prep table or equipment but any utensils in the surface that they're sitting on need to be cleaned and sanitized once every four hours minimum, and that's to um, make sure that we're not allowing bacteria to uh, grow. And we're going to, we could also store any utensils in water that's at least 135 degrees. Um, if 
they are used with a non potentially hazardous food like ice, we could um, keep them in a clean, protected location, like on the side of an ice machine. You see that there's um, generally a, a container to, to uh, store the ice, the ice scoop in. We could also store them in running water, um, like in the dip well you see in the picture below. There has to be um, constantly running water, and it has to be enough to flush the food particles down the drain so that uh, bacteria is not growing in that water. We don't want it to be standing water. Some other ways that we can avo avoid contamination, making sure that we have screening or air curtains for doors and windows uh, to keep pests out. And that's definitely something, um, you know, you're all working in kitchens in the summer and it's hot. And we know that you definitely need good ventilation in order to, to you know, work in that type of environment. But just make sure that if you're opening windows or opening doors, that there's, there's a screen um, to protect the entrances. We need to make sure that we're maintaining clean ventilation. So if we have exhaust systems or fans, they need to be clean so that we're not uh, blowing dust around or contaminating the food. We want to make sure that we avoid cross contacts. And this is, um, speaking of allergens, uh, not like bacteria or virus, but allergens. So the person in charge needs to know what the major allergens are, and they're listed there for you, milk, egg, fish, shellfish, tree nuts, wheat, protein, uh, sorry, peanuts, and soybeans. The person in charge needs to make sure that the employees are trained so that they know how to handle um, an allergen. If they've got um, a child at camp that can't have a certain food, then they need to be trained so that they know how they're going to handle that situation and that they know how to avoid cross contact. Ways to avoid uh, cross contamination, you could use separate equipment um, or time to separate raw and ready to eat food prep. And what this means is maybe you have one prep table on one side of the kitchen and you always use that for raw proteins like um, chicken and beef. Of course, you're going to clean and sanitize before you would prep those food types, but um, and then on the other side of the kitchen, you might have a table that you use only to prepare ready to eat foods and um, prepare your raw salads. But if you only have one prep table, you could use that for everything you prep. You just have to make sure that you clean it and sanitize it between uses to make sure that you're not cross-contaminating um, your raw proteins and your, raw, your, your, your other ready to eat foods. You want to make sure that we clean sealed containers of visible soil before we open them. That's generally like a like a can of food, you want to make sure that you um, you could take your sandy cloth out of your clean sandy bucket and wipe down the top before you open that so that nothing from the outside of the container gets uh, into it. We're going to separate uh, fruits and vegetables before we wash them. They could come from different regions and have different virus or bacteria on them, so we don't want to put them together before they're washed. And then if we're using any ice to cool beverages like um, bottles of water or soda, we're not going to reuse that ice to, uh, as an ingredient in a food or in contact with food. We need to make sure that our food is coming from an approved source. So um, most folks get their food from a, you know, a delivery uh, truck and they're, you know, they're making sure that your food is coming from an approved source. If you're sourcing it locally, um, you want to make sure that, that uh, the, where you're getting it from is an approved source like a retail food outlet, and they need to have a license uh, in most cases. So we're going to make sure that foods are delivered at the proper temperature and intact packaging. Raw potentially has, I'm sorry, potentially hazardous foods are going to be delivered at 41 or less. Raw shell eggs are going to be delivered at an ambient air temp of 45 um, or less. And rarely, but sometimes, kitchens will receive their food hot because they're a serving site only. And if they're getting um, hot food, it needs to be delivered at 135 or hotter. When you are um, receiving your food, you want to make sure that you're looking for signs of thaw and refreeze when you're inspecting it. And that might look like um, something you normally get, like maybe frozen blueberries. They're all, um, normally when you get them, you can feel each berry individually. But when you get them this time, they're all in kind of one big clump, all frozen together. That might be a sign of thaw and refreeze. Um, or if you see uh, damage to the uh, case itself, that looks like it might have gotten wet. We're also going to inspect our delivery for signs of pests. So you're probably not going to see the lower left situation going on, but um, what we're more looking for is like up on the right, you see some um, mouse dropping right in with that case of lettuce. So that would be something that you want to send back. You don't want to take that and use it. 
We're going to make sure that we store our food once we get it in a clean, dry area. All food needs to be stored at least six inches off the floor. We're not going to store food where it's exposed to splash, dust, or other contamination. And we want to make sure that food is completely covered in storage, so in, whether it's in a refrigerator, um, in a freezer, or in dry storage. If we have food that's cooling, we don't want that completely covered um, until it's cooled down to 41. We'll talk about that more when we talk about cooling. You want to make sure that you're storing food so that raw produce and ready to eat foods um, cannot become contaminated by raw animal foods. And you want to also want to make sure that raw animal foods are not becoming contaminated by other raw animal foods. Um, some kind of examples that I've seen of, of poor food storage practices are sometimes people will pull out like um, the big roll of um, ground beef and they'll pull out some chicken and they'll put them in the same pan to thaw in the fridge. And that's just uh, not an appropriate way to do it. We want to make sure that we're keeping those things separate so that they don't have a chance to contaminate each other. We want to make sure that if we are holding any foods to return them um, for refund or credit, that we store them away from our good stock. Um, it's also a good idea to label the area um, so that people know that the food is not okay to use. So we're looking at things like if they have broken seals, torn packaging, or dented cans. Um, you might get drop shipments and notice that uh, after food's been delivered that it's past date, any spoiled food you'd want to hold for um, credit or any recall foods, you definitely want to keep those in a separate area. So um, I've inspected a couple of camps in the last couple summers that have gone from serving food from a line um, inside the kitchen to serving food out on tables as like a buffet. And they like the sense of community that brings, and they like the way that that works. But we just need to make sure that food that's on display is protected um, either by being packaged as single serve, that it's in a display case, like you see down um, on the left, or that's under a sneeze guard, like you see over on the right. So we just need, we want to make sure that if you know people are talking or sneezing that or coughing, that none of that contamination is going to land on the food. We also need to make sure that we provide separate utensils for each food product that's being served so that people aren't tempted to use one spoon for something beside it um, and contaminate the food. There might be an allergen somebody else isn't aware of in one food going into the next. We also are going to require clean tableware. So you can put up a sign saying that, you know, must use clean tableware um, when returning to the, to the buffet. We just, people shouldn't be serving onto a dirty plate. We need to create and follow a written policy for using time only as a control for safety if foods are held without temperature control. And that's something that I have noticed as well. Um, folks are setting food out on a table as a buffet, and they may not have a way to keep all that hot food either hot or, or that cold food cold. So um, generally when we see this, we kind of ask what you're doing, how long has it been out? But if you're going to hold food that way, then you need to have an actual policy for that. That's something that the person in charge could create uh, a good policy stating that uh, we're going to we bring the food out for lunch at 11 a.m. and the food is going to be discarded by 3 p.m. And we need to make sure that we're somehow labeling the food so that uh, we know how long it's been out. And a really important thing with the time only policy is that whether it's out for half an hour or four hours, you still have to throw it away. You're not allowed to bring that food back into the kitchen and cool it down. Um, or reheat it. Cold foods have to be held at 41 or less, and hot foods must be held at 135 or hotter. When we're thawing potentially hazardous food, we want to make sure that, um, that we're doing it properly. The best way is always under refrigeration at 41 or less. However, in a lot of cases, we don't have time to wait for it to thaw under that, or maybe we um, hadn't pulled enough food and we need to thaw some of it quickly. We could also thaw under cold running water. The water has to be 70 or less, and we need to make sure that um, for ready-to-eat potentially hazardous foods, that portions of thawed uh, foods cannot go over 41 degrees. So basically, as soon as it's thawed, um, you want to remove it from the water. If there are raw animal foods being thawed, um, then they can't be above 41 for more than four hours, including the time that they were exposed to the running water and, again, the time that it takes to cool them back down to 41. We can thaw food as part of the cooking process, and we can thaw food in the microwave, but we have to take it immediately from the microwave to either the fry pan, the oven, the steamer, whatever, to finish cooking it off. 
just a list of cooking temps for you. Um, I believe we included a handout on this as well. I'm not going to go through this word for it, but it's there for reference for you guys. When we're cooling potentially hazardous food, we want to make sure that um, we get it cool from 135 to 70 within two hours, and we have a total of six hours to cool it from 135 to 41. So if we cool our food from 135 to 70 in an hour, that gives us uh, five hours to get it down to 41. The, whole, the total process can't take more than six hours, but it's critical that the 135 to 70 um, happens in two hours. Uh, that's, an, again, another thing that it, it would be great to have a policy for. Um, so if your person in charge can actually create a way to make sure this happens, and taking temperatures is really important because otherwise you're not going to know. We're going to cool potentially hazardous food um, from an ambient air temp, so like canned food if you open a can of tuna, from 41 to 4, uh, I'm sorry, from room temp to 41 within four hours. And we see um, over on the right there, that's kind of like the ideal way to cool food quickly. They've got an ice bath going and they have ice paddles right in the food. So it's getting cooled from the outside and from the inside at the same time. Um, I really like the ice paddle. The only thing that I like to make sure that I mention to people is that if you're going to use them, you need to make sure that you're storing them covered um, in the freezer. It is a food contact surface on the outside. A lot of times I just see them sitting around. So put them in a food, food grade bag or wrap them up or something to keep them protected in the freezer. Other ways to cool um, hazardous foods quickly, using shallow pans. Uh, something like rice, if it's in a big pot, will take a long time to cool, but if you spread it out um, into like cookie sheets, it's going to cool a lot more quickly. Separate food into smaller, thinner portions, like if you cook a pork roast, you want to cut it up so that it will cool more quickly. Um, using rapid cooling equipment, not a lot of us can afford a blast chiller, um, but you could also use the ice paddles. And stirring food while it's in an ice water bath could use an ice water bath without the ice paddle, but just make sure you stir the food so that the, um, the warmer food in the center gets transferred to the outside where the ice, is in the ice water is in touch with the container. Using containers that facilitate heat transfer, like metal pans, adding ice as an ingredient. So if you make a soup, but you don't put as much water in it as you need when you cook it, you could add ice to it to make up the difference to cool it down. Uh, make sure you use thermometers to monitor the process and cover food completely once it's cooled to 41. When we're reheating food for hot holding, we want to make sure that it um, reaches 165 for 15 seconds in all parts. If you're going to reheat in a microwave, then you need to make sure that you stir it in the middle um, and that it's covered and allowed to sit for a couple of minutes, so two minutes after you're reheating it. And then you want to temp it in several spots. Um, microwave ovens don't always heat evenly, so we want to make sure that throughout it has reached the 165. If we're reheating food that is from a commercially uh, processed hermetically sealed container, so like a canned food like the corn you see there, we can heat it to 135, and then we have to hold it at 135 to maintain safety. If um, And we also need to make sure that Foods are being rapidly reheated from 165 within two hours. Uh, a lot of times we'll see people um, reheating food in a crock pot or by just throwing it into a steam table. That's not really a good idea because those pieces of equipment are meant to, um, well, a crock pot to cook food, but it's not meant to heat food quickly. So we we'll want to make sure that we preheat that equipment, that we heat the food either on the stove <coughs> in the microwave and make sure that it reaches 165 within two hours. Then we could hot hold it in that type of equipment at 135 or hotter. We've just included this again for reference, the temperature chart, and um, I believe that we hit, sent this as a handout as well, and it's on our website. This just shows the different, um, the cold zone, 41 or less, the hot holding zone, 135 or hotter, the danger zone, which is in between, and the reheating and cooling uh, as well. So just use that for reference. We need our thermometers to be accurate within um, plus or minus two degrees Fahrenheit. We need to make sure that our thermometers are appropriate for the intended use. I see out and about, I see a lot of probe style thermometers that have a little dimple about two and a half inches up on the stem. And those types of thermometers are good for um, temping soups and thick foods, but they can be um, 
it can be really hard to temp a thin food like a like a beef patty with that type of thermometer. So if you've got to temp thinner foods, you need to make sure that you have a thermometer that only needs the tip of the thermometer to be inserted into the food in order to get an accurate reading. Um, I feel a lot of people also trying to use infrared thermometers to take internal food temps, and that's just the infrared thermometer is not going to get an accurate internal food temp. So make sure that you have a, um, a probe style thermometer for that. And make sure that you know how to use your thermometer correctly. Um, again, some people don't realize how far they have to insert the probe into the food in order to get an accurate reading. So make sure that you look at your uh, manufacturer's instructions for your thermometer. We need to make sure that we calibrate our thermometers as often as we need to ensure that they're accurate. Um, this kind of depends on how much use they get. It's, if you drop your thermometer, it's always a good idea to check it and make sure that it doesn't need to be recalibrated um, or recalibrated if it does need to be. A lot of people use the ice water bath um, method for uh, calibrating their thermometer and it's, it's a good way to do it. It's the best way to do it, but you just need to make sure you're using enough ice and really cold water and that you're giving time for that um, solution to assimilate down to 32 before you're calibrating your thermometer with it. You need to make sure that you provide thermometers in all refrigeration units, freezers, and hot hold units, and they need to be placed um, in the warmest part of the refrigeration unit and the coldest part of the hot uh, food storage unit, and they need to be easy to read and placed so that people can easily view them. That way, when you're in and out of the fridge, you can easily check your thermometer every day. And we do also require that you date mark potentially hazardous food that's held on site, uh, that's prepared and held on site for more than 24 hours. And you are supposed to mark the discard date on that. We cannot keep this food for more than seven days, and the day that we prep it counts as day one. We also require that if you have food made by a manufacturer that is a potentially hazardous food, it needs to be clearly marked when the original container was opened to be used within seven days or by the use by date on the container, whichever comes first. If you combine foods, like you make a potato salad and you cook the potatoes one day, the eggs the next day, and then you mix it on the third day, you want to make sure that you put the date um, that would correspond with the date that the potatoes would have to be discarded on that label. And you can use calendar dates, days of the week, or other effective means to date mark your food. Um, so we just show a couple of different types of stickers you can use. You can use, you know, tape, just write it on that. It doesn't have to be uh, a, a, a purchased uh, marker. It could be something that you just write onto the side of the container. We need to make sure that we're maintaining clean surfaces. Um, in order to maintain clean surfaces, our physical facilities need to be maintained um, in good repair. And we also need to make sure that we have a mop or utility sink in order to dispose of gray water from cleaning. Food and non-food contact services need to be smooth and uh, need to be maintained in good repair. Non-food contact surfaces are surfaces that are exposed to splash and splatter um, from foods during food preparation, cooking, or dishwashing. And non-food contact surfaces have to be cleaned as often as they um, need to be to keep them free of residue. Food contact services need to be not just cleaned, but they also have to be sanitized. So this is like your dishes, utensils, cooking equipment. Um, common ways to clean this equipment is the three-bay process or a dish machine. Large equipment like slices or steam kettles may need to be cleaned in an alternative way because they don't, they can't be put through the three-bay process or, in a, or through a dish machine. But we need to remove the soil particles and rinse away the detergent used and sanitize properly. So essentially, it's still going through the same process. And the slide just talks about when to clean and sanitize food contact surfaces. So before using them with different types of raw animal food, um, each time there is a change from working with raw to ready to eat foods between uses with raw fruits and vegetables and with potentially hazardous foods before um, using or storing a food thermometer and any time during the operation when contamination may have occurred. This uh, handout just shows the three bay process. So we're gonna wash in the first bay there with hot water at least 110 degrees, and then we're going to rinse with either clean running water from the tap, or we could um, make a, a bay or half bay of clean water and just kind of dip our dishes in them to rinse off the soap. And then we're going to submerge our dishes in the third bay using 
an approved sanitizer. We generally see chlorine or quaternary ammonium compound sanitizers. And we're going to make sure that we follow the instructions on the product label for sanitizing food contact surfaces. And then we're going to pull them out and let them air dry. So it's really important that when we're operating our dish machines that we refer to the data plate on the machine. So there's a picture on the right there of what a uh, data plate looks like. It has some really important information on it. It's going to tell you what the required cycle times and temperatures are, what the required rinse pressure is for a high temp machine. And for a low temp machine, it's going to tell you what your required sanitizer residual is. And um, low temp machines uh, use chlorine sanitizer. So this is another one where we go into a, we might go into a camp early in the summer and their dishwasher might not be quite working how it should be yet. Uh, it's really important for your person in charge to really train the person washing the dishes on, on what these parameters are for their dish machine so that they can, so that every day they can make sure that this is working properly so that you know that you're sanitizing your dishes. This slide uh, has kind of the four major types of um, high temp dishwashers. You'll, I'm not going to read through them all, but generally you're going to see a 150 or 160 minimum and uh, on the wash and a 180 minimum on the rinse. Um, and we want to make sure that that wash temp is correct as well. A lot of people will look, oh yeah, well it's 130 on the wash, but it is getting to 180 on the rinse, so I'm fine. Well, that wash temp helps to bring up the temperature, this, the surface temperature of the dish, and it's a longer um, it's a longer time that the dishwasher is washing than, than rinsing. And then that last shorter rinse, that's really high temp, is going to bring that surface temp of the dish up to get it up to 160. So it is important that our wash temp is meeting the um, requirement on the data plate as well. And uh, high temp dishwashers are generally required to have a, um, a rinse pressure of 15 to 25 on the sanitizing rinse and it can't be less than 5 PSI or more than 30 PSI, um, according to the food code. And the pressure gauge needs to measure in increments of 1 PSI or smaller. There's a common example of what we see for um, a pressure gauge down there at the bottom. They don't have to have that little green marked area on them. That makes it convenient to tell whether or not the pressure is in the right, um, the right PSI range, though. The low temp dishwasher. Um, is going to wash and rinse on a single temperature. Generally, it's 120. And some manufacturers do require that it be higher at like 130 or 140. Again, you're going to refer to the data plate for that information for your machine. And generally, you're going to see a 50 part per million chlorine residual on the sanitizing rinse. And you want to make sure that you know how to test the chlorine residual of your dishwasher. There's just some different types of test strips down at the bottom there that can be used. Uh, usually we'll run a rack of dishes and then get some water off of one of the dishes uh, with a test strip and then um, match it up with the, uh, the color on the container there to see what the part per million is. If we're using, we, if we're using wiping cloth, uh, they either need to be maintained dry or held in a sanitizer solution. They need to be fully submerged in the sanitizer solution to ensure that uh, the entire cloth is being maintained sanitary. Again, generally we see either quaternary ammonium compound sanitizer uh, or chlorine sanitizer in the solutions in these buckets. The quaternary ammonium compound sanitizer has to be uh, 75 minimum and 200 to 400 parts per million quaternary ammonium compound. And the chlorine sanitizer is going to be mixed um, 50 to 200 parts per million chlorine. It's best to use your sani bucket in conjunction with a wash bucket. That way you can remove the physical soil before sanitizing. That's also going to help keep your uh, sani bucket cleaner so it will maintain sanitizing uh, conditions longer. If you're, you need to use separate buckets for cloths for surfaces in use with raw foods, like raw proteins versus ready to eat foods. And make sure that you change your sanitizer solution when it's visibly soiled, if it's not at the right temperature, or um, if the sanitizer residual is depleted, um, where it's not sanitizing anymore. So for quat sanitizer below 200 or for chlorine sanitizer below 50. And if you're not sure, people ask me all the time, well, how long will it sit out? And it really depends on how much you're using it. Um, so if you're in doubt, you can always 
get out your thermometer, test the temperature, and use a test strip to see how strong the solution is. So we've also um, come up with some, some real physical ways that you can really prepare for your inspection. Um, cleaning the kitchen and storage area thoroughly ahead of camp opening is a, is a really good idea. This way you can kind of see what might have gotten in over the winter. Um, you know, our, we live in a rural state and uh, you may find evidence of pests or rodents. This will give you a chance to clean and disinfect any of the affected areas to close up any holes um, that may allow pests in. You can set traps for rodents or contact your pest control company if you do find evidence to kind of monitor and make sure that you're getting rid of what's there. And make sure that you're making any necessary repairs to the physical facilities. Uh, maybe you had a leak over the winter. Uh, maybe some screens have torn. You can get that stuff fixed. Maybe some of your shelving um, on the inside has is painted wood and it needs to be repainted, stuff like that. You should turn on all of your equipment. Make sure that all your cold holding equipment, like your refrigeration units and freezers, are cooling and freezing properly. Um, same thing with any hot holding equipment. And check for thermometers in all your refrigeration and freezer units to make sure that um, they're still there, that they haven't been um, taken out and cleaning or anything like that. That you run the dishwasher to make sure that um, the thermometers and gauges are working properly, that chemicals are dispensing properly and that the parameters um, on the data plate are being met. That way, if you do this before camp starts, it gives you time to contact a repair person if necessary to, to fix that before you get going. You wanna make sure that you post up your license and your current CFPM certification in public view, and that you enjoy your summer, and make sure to ask us questions when we come to see you so that you can learn something new. And that's the end of what we have for you guys. Again, um, hopefully this will help you not only prepare for us um, coming in to do a physical inspection, but we do look at a lot of food um, handling. That's a huge part of our inspection. So um, it's great to see folks who are striving toward active managerial control and who have policies and procedures um, for safe practices for thawing, cooling, um, cooking, and reheating. So um, thank you very much for your time and we'll answer any questions. So one thing we might mention is that all of the documents are on the main summer camp website. Okay. And all the all the documents are on the main summer camp website. Oh, we do have a question. Oh, oops. What's the proper way to store liners? Linen? What is the proper way to store linens? So you want to make sure that your linens um, are stored in a clean, protected area. Um, no, really, not really any different from storing your food or your single serve items, like takeout containers, and six inches off the floor, right? Um, and if you have um, dirty linens, then you definitely want to store those separately. You don't want to store your linens in um, a restroom or anything like that. They should be out in a clean area. CFPM stands for Certified Food Protection Manager. Um, there are several courses that people can do to uh, meet that requirement. Probably the most popular one that we see is the Serve Safe Manager course. Okay. <laughs> um, can I have a, I have a question too? So with the thermometer on the refrigeration and freezers, there's often an external one, but you're looking for internal ones as well, or does the external one meet your requirements? Or the external thermometer is an internal thermometer. It's okay. getting an internal temperature. It has a probe that goes inside the equipment. Okay. It's never a bad idea to have more than one. We require that you have a thermometer. It's never a bad idea to have more than one in a couple different locations. Um, because there are going to be different temperatures in the cooling unit. Uh, also, if you're storing too much food um, where the air is coming into the unit, then it can block air circulation. And if you have a couple different thermometers hanging out in the refrigerator, then you can easily see, like, oh, okay, something's going on, because up here it's 41, but down here it's 50, what's going on? Then you can kind of move your food around and see if that helps. Also, in a large cooler like a walk-in, there it definitely has varying temperatures throughout the unit. So in order to know that, more thermometers are really needed. But.
when you were talking about food sources, you mentioned um, local approved sources. What's an approved source? Like the grocery store. You know, if they have to run out to the grocery store to get something, that's going to be an approved source. How about farms that you can bring it up from? If they have generally a license. If they're if you're buying produce, that's not um, they don't need a license to sell you that. Produce and eggs, both. Right. Fine. Produce and eggs, they don't need a license to sell you. Um, but if they're going to be selling, if you're, they could buy meat from a local farm if it's certified, if it's slaughtered under inspection and it's inspected and approved. And they would have How about right. Canned food. Um, if they purchase canned food, like home canned, farm. they need to have a license to do that with the Department of Agriculture. Yeah, it's really important if you're if you're um, sourcing a food locally, which is great. You know, all about sourcing local sourcing local products. But make sure that they're licensed to do what they um, what they're doing. If they want to sell you bread um, and you go there to buy the bread and you see they also have pickles, and you're like, okay, well, I'll buy the pickles too. Make sure they have um, make sure they are approved to do that on their license. Ag licenses are specific, and they they list all the things that they're allowed to prepare. Right now. Well, it looks like there's no more questions. Um, thank you so much, um, Jen and you. Laurie, for being here today and presenting this. It's um, very enlightening and gives us a lot to think about. So, there's a thank you for coming in from other people. So. <laughs> Thank you very much for um, offering this platform for us. We, we appreciate it. It's nice to be able to get out and yeah. get this information And out. this is recorded too, which is wonderful. So, you know, our, when we have our, if our person in charge is not actually with us right now, um, it is a good opportunity for us to log on to our main summer camp website and see where it is recorded and ask them to review this information as well um, prior to the summer. Um, one more question. Oh, one more question. Okay. Have you scrolled down a bit there? Last minute question. Oh, uh, Mary Doyle. Oh, there we go. Now, this, the question is asking whether the person in charge, the CSPM, needs to be present in the kitchen at all times. Um, they don't have to be present in the kitchen at all times. They really need to be the person that's in charge of the overall operation of the kitchen. They need to be present a lot of the time. Um, they're in charge of training and ensuring that employees are, are doing their job as they've been trained to do. Um, but they don't have to be there. They don't have to be there all the time. But, but there, there does need to be someone who is in charge. Right. There does need to be somebody who's in charge. Not necessarily the certified food protection manager, but a person in charge at all times. Right. So if the if the um, if your kitchen manager is not there or your certified person, then they need to there needs to be a designation of who is in charge when they're not there, so that um, that person and their staff know that if there's you know if this person sees that something's not right, they have the authority to still tell the other employees, hey, look, you can't uh, pick food up off the floor and cook it. You know, something like that. They need to have the authority to to still. Um, Kind of run the kitchen even if they're not certified and be trained well by the person in charge. There's another question there. If you put milk out on the buffet, can it come back into the kitchen? If it's being held properly at 41 or less and it's not becoming contaminated, you're keeping it from being contaminated, then it can go back into the kitchen. Okay. Is there another one down there? I don't think so. But Yep. So again, as long as you're maintaining, if you have a way to keep that cold um, in the jug. The only way to know is to, to temp the it. temperature. Yeah, because if you don't have it down, sitting down into a cold hold unit and you just put the gallon jug out, chances are it's not going to stay at 41. Um, but again, taking the temperature before you bring it back into the kitchen would be the way to know. Very good. They do also, there are um, insulated containers that you can kind of freeze 
and then put your milk into and put it out to keep it cold. They're like salad bar containers and they're refreezable. They yeah. come in different shapes and sizes. I think that's it. That's it. Well, thank you everyone and uh, have a great day. Now you can talk. Okay. <laughs> also, yeah. Janet and Lori, as I had said in the beginning, if you want, once I get it converted, if you want this presentation to use with other restaurants or wherever, uh, I'll make the uh, thing available. Yeah. Or you can always use it as a reference when you go to camp too. Yeah. Like, oh, by the way, did you see the it's, uh, presentation? That's a great thing. You know, anytime we can educate people, it's a good good opportunity. Well, and I think this type of format is uh, going to be more and more useful for people, yeah. particularly like with camps. I mean, so many of their food managers aren't around. Yeah. And they now can just go onto our website and click in and, and, and watch it. it. And as you said, the documents are right next to it. So, well, thank you. Jim. Excellent right. job. Really thank you, Laurie. Know that we're not their enemies. Yes. <laughs> we're doing work together, right? Sorry. Nope. Really? You want one now? Yeah. I think I'm just thinking about one of our restaurants. Right. And I'm thinking about the stuff. Laurie, I'm thinking about the stuff. I mean, I have to go to the restaurant. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I have eight that you see. You know? So, um, and most of my cans are. So you have the rest of them are off. My, my, she has to keep No, no, I'm in the can. So I'm in the can. But the cans that are in my area are generally not ECA cans. And I don't even know if they're with you guys, to be honest, a lot of them. Or they might be. Well, the, no, a lot aren't. But after you had a, a bunch of fail last year, three of them joined us. Yeah. Like yeah. Camp Postcard was one. Okay. I don't know. Um, I can't remember the others, but the, the, because they're looking to you for help. For, for help. They have exactly. to do this and get it right, which yeah. is great. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, I've got a lot From of small It's difficult. It's difficult. It's pretty bad. Yeah. What camp for you? Oh, you're whispering. I mean, we can pass it along. I feel like you would ask Lisa that. It's just like you want to catch us for not doing it, and that's not the point. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. no. no I know. When I go in, like. and I really, I really try hard to to talk to people and kind of get them to relax. It's yeah. Like, look, yeah. you know, yes, yeah, things are going to be on the paper. It's not yeah. what's here. It's where we go from here. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's kind of my philosophy. You know, what, you're gonna be in. what more are you going to do with somebody to help them to improve? Right. You know? Right. So, and that's why I think this is good because it kind of lets you see that. You know, this is kind of an avenue. You're making that step. You're making this educational, you know, yeah. and I think that's really important too. Yeah, like, even, even though I know this stuff pretty much backwards, it was like I still get little pieces that was like, oh, okay. So I, need to, I need to be yeah. looking for that too. Great. Thanks. Like, Thank great. you. Appreciate it.